Welcome to sections 4.5. We'll also cover 4.6 and just a little bit of 4.7. So when we start off here, the first thing we're going to discuss is the, the differences between, between asexual reproduction and sexual. Now, each of these has benefits. If you are small, if you're unicellular, if you reproduce a lot with a really fast lifespan, things like bacteria, things like unicellular eukaryotes, things that can typically reproduce in a matter of minutes or hours, they have so many reproductive events that they tend to just get mutations that occur from DNA replication. They get screw-ups. And that allows for them to get enough diversity to survive and thrive, even though they're attempting to produce identical organisms each time. But the key thing here is you typically have to be small and reproduce very fast. If that's the case, asexual is going to be much better than sexual because it gets rid of this whole need to find mates, everybody produces offspring, it's great. But for most organisms that are multicellular, so we're talking about bigger stuff, plants, animals, these types of organisms reproduce slowly. I don't care if you want to look at a rabbit and say, oh wow, they reproduce fast. Even a rabbit's going to produce maybe six little bunny rabbits every month at its peak reproductive times. That's incredibly slow. You know, a bacteria at its peak could produce a, another offspring, so one to two cells, every 20 minutes. And that's exponential because two makes four, four makes eight, eight makes 16. So a bacteria within a single day could relatively simply produce millions or billions of other bacteria. A rabbit in a single day produces no real rabbits. I mean, it could help grow, I guess, those six bunnies, but they need 29 more days. And that's something that's pretty fast. So when we're looking at bigger organisms, they're all going to reproduce relatively slowly compared to single-celled stuff. And so they can't rely on mutations to provide them with enough diversity. So instead, they take this idea of mixing half the DNA from one parent with another random half from the other parent to make sure their offspring are all going to be different. And so this allows for that diversity despite the fact that reproduction is so much slower. So that will be the best for sexual. <clears throat> now asexual, there's multiple types. You've got binary fission and mitosis. This is for prokaryotes, binary fission. Uh, mitosis is kind of the equivalent for eukaryotes. This one's going to be going from one cell, pow, split it, two cells, all set. Pretty straightforward. Clones. Budding is going to be when a parent organism can manage to have offspring kind of just develop gradually off of it. And then eventually they typically, like in these sea anemones, will actually reach a point where they're mature enough that they can meander off on their own. So imagine if you're like growing a baby just off your hip and then eventually it was just like pops down, skedaddles off uh, once it reaches a point where it can go on its own. We don't do that. It'd be cool if we did, but we don't, but that's budding. All right. And then fragmentation would be like starfish and such where chunks of them as they break off can actually go ahead and grow whole new individuals. Other plants do different stuff too. They can have where they use their root system and shoot up new plants or bulbs, like, you know, things like potatoes. So there's plenty of different ways of doing asexual reproduction. It's not just about the unicellular way of binary fission or mitosis. There are some animals and plants that will use asexual reproduction that are multicellular. Now for sexual reproduction, the goal here is you're going to go through meiosis, which is going to produce these haploid 1N gametes. And then those gametes are going to meet up. Typically, one will be a sperm, one will be the ovum or egg. And then they're going to meet up and do something called fertilization, where they actually stick together. And so in this case, that makes us go from 1N plus 1N to good old-fashioned diploid zygote. Now, a zygote is kind of cool because this is the very first cell of an organism. In a multicellular organism like you and me, we started out as one single cell, a zygote. That cell did a lot of mitosis, a lot, to ultimately produce you, which if you're about a full-grown individual, you're talking about 100 trillion cells that you possess right now from that one original zygote. Now, with meiosis, it's going to differ from mitosis in a couple key ways. The first of which is it's going to produce four cells that are 1N instead of during mitosis for our cells where we go from a 2N cell to a 2N copy. We just get two 2N copies, right? We, we do one to two. So with this, we're going from a 2N starting cell and we are going to produce four 1N cells, the gametes, as a result. 
Now it does this by doing two cell divisions. So the first cell division takes us from one cell to two, and it specifically takes us from essentially 4n, right? That's going to be we've doubled our chromatids, so we have 4n chromatids, to having 2n chromatids, and we don't copy our DNA here. So we just keep it, 2n, which we then divide up again, and so each of these two 2n cells after meiosis 1, the first split, now become two 1n cells. And because this happens twice, that gives us a total of four cells. So during meiosis, the whole point at the end is we are not producing copies. We're producing these 1n cells that are not a complete re replica of the parent. And we're producing four of them through two cell divisions rather than two of them through one. The other way that things differ is during meiosis 1, we're going to go through and divide what we call the homologs. What that is is that if you remember, we have like chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, and for each of them we have two copies. We have mom's copy and dad's copy. That's why we said that we consider ourselves diploid, 2n. That means we have two sets. So for every type of chromosome, we've got moms and we've got dads. Moms, dads, moms, dads, all the way through. That's why we have 46 chromosomes, not 23. And so what's going to happen here in this first part is we're going to line up dad's chromosome and we're going to line up mom's chromosome together. So we're going to take those pairs, these homologs, and we're going to say, all right, chromosome ones, you guys line up together. Chromosome two, line up together. So instead of being single file, this is actually going to be double file lines. First in mitosis, it was single file. And then we're going to split the homologs we're not going to split the sister chromatids. Notice the sister chromatids are still attached here. Dad's and a sister chromatid. Mom's and her sister chromatid, or copy. And so that's what's going to happen in meiosis 1. In meiosis 2, we're now going to line up the chromosomes that we have, and we're going to split the chromatids. You see it's going this way. So we line up the chromosomes, and then as we split it, we now have just the individual chromatids, which we called chromosomes, we said once they split. So meiosis 1, divide the homologous chromosomes. Meiosis 2, divide the sister chromatids. Overall result for 1n cells that we call sex cells or gametes. All right, very last slide. Gametogenesis, I'm going to do quick. But remember we talked about females, they were pretty much about quality. And so females have to provide this, this egg, this ovum, and it has to have all the cytoplasm, it's got to have the organelles, it's got to have all the good stuff. And so how they do this is instead of trying to make four eggs, they actually produce three things called polar bodies, which are just re-ingested by the body, they, they're not used. And then they produce one good ovum. So we go from one cell to one cell because they're focused on making it a really good cell. For males we talked about, we're about quantity. And so sperm are small. They don't have to survive on their own or provide much other than DNA. So when we do this process, we'll go from one cell and we'll go to four cells. So each of these cells we produce at the end will be a sperm cell, which will be much smaller than the egg. You know, it's not going to bring as much to the party, but ultimately it has everything it needs to live its short lifespan of probably a couple days tops in the female reproductive tract. And if it finds the egg, Ta-da, fertilization. If it doesn't, it's just reabsorbed, it dies.